Good morning, Trinity. Welcome in from the rain. We are glad you are here with us together to worship as a community. It is a, a good thing for us to be together this morning. Amen? Amen. Let me uh, inform you about some of the things that are going on in our community this week and encourage you to participate in them as you have time. Uh, first, tomorrow uh, at 10 a.m. in the library, we'll be having a book talk from our very own Dr. Joshua Jip on his new book, A Pauline Theology as a Way of Life. That's at 10 a.m. tomorrow in Rolfing Library. And later at 11, we'll be continuing on in Mosaic uh, with our series on reconciliation uh, with a presentation from Dr. Eric Rivera on reconciliation with others. That's tomorrow, 11 a.m. in Hinkson Hall, right behind us right here in Rodine. And of course, there is a free lunch. So please do come out to that. On Thursday, we continue with our Subversive Orthodoxy series, which is a chance for us as a community to engage in discussions on important topics that face us as believers of the body of Christ. This will be a conversation on why, uh, around the question, why or should immigrant churches exist? And this will be a discussion uh, between our very own Dr. Peter Cha and Dr. Dana Harris. So we invite you out to that. That's to, uh, Thursday at 11 a.m., and again, there's a free lunch. Two free lunches in a row. Sounds good to me. We have a couple of other things going on a little bit later on in October. We, we're, we're having actually a uh, big fall fest for our community here on Saturday, October 7th from 3 to 5 p.m. That will be out on the lawn next to the Waybright Center. It will include things like bouncy houses and bouncy slides and cotton candy and pumpkin carving and all that, all the wonderful things that make fall so wonderful uh, for, uh, for us and our family. So the whole community is invited. Uh, please get the word out. You'll see flyers around campus as well. We also want to, uh, the Paul Hebert Center wants to invite all students to the Thriving Immigrant Congregations Initiative meeting uh, on October 12th. This will be a, from 2 to 6 p.m. and it is a chance for us to hear the different uh, the different things that churches who have been participating in this two-year initiative have been learning. It's a unique opportunity for us to hear what is going on in immigrant churches and how they are uh, uh, trying to understand how to continue to thrive in the world that we live in today. So we invite you all to participate with that. Please, RSVP by October 8th using the QR code right there, or you will see signs around campus as well. And lastly, of course, we always extend the invitation for anyone who needs prayer. Please do submit your prayer requests to the chapel via this QR code or go to the chapel page on my TIU where you can find the link uh, to our prayer request page. We would love, absolutely love to pray for you. Trinity, hear now this call to worship from Psalm 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of his faithful people. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. Let's worship together, Trinity. Let's rise. We're going to be singing this song, No Other Name, uh, in English, but also in Spanish, as we reflect on the nature of, of the global nature of the church uh, this morning here, and here in this chapel. We will be hearing uh, scripture and songs in different languages. So as you are able, please sing with us, uh, but we encourage you to sing in whatever language you, you feel comfortable. Praise the name above all names, the one who reigns for Still the same, praise the name, Jesus, name above all names, the one who reigns forever, still the same, praise the name, no other name that's higher, no other name. That's stronger, no other name. Forever I will praise the name. No 
other name can heal us, no other name can free us, no other name so precious. Let's praise the name. Sing, praise the name. Oh, praise the name above all names, the one who reigns forever, still the same. Praise the name, Jesus, name above all names, the one who reigns forever, still the same. Praise the name. Nombre no hay, nombre no hay más grande, nombre no hay más fuerte, nombre no hay por siempre ven exaltale, nombre no hay que sane, nombre no hay que salve, nombre no hay precioso. Exaltale. Sing together, every nation. Every nation, all creation. Every nation, and every nation, all creation, we proclaim your name. Sing, Jesus, 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 Jesus. No. Precious, let's praise the name. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we know that you are a gracious God, a God full of compassion. That is why we come before you this morning with all our burdens, with things that might be heavy, weighing heavy on our hearts, things that are troubling us, worries and concerns for our health, for our families, well-being, financial needs, just the study and the work that we're involved in. We thank you that we can bring everything and lay everything at your feet, that we can seek your face, seek your presence, and that you will not turn us down, you will not turn us away. And we thank you for this graciousness that we will hear about today. And we think of the many struggles of brothers and sisters all around the world who are suffering from persecution, especially in Pakistan, where churches are being burned, Christians are being driven out of their homes, 
that you will protect your children there and that they will be a testimony and that you yourself will reveal yourself with graciousness and mercy upon these uh, people there. We pray for the situation of war in so many countries that we often forget about. Aside from Ukraine and Russia, we have suffering happening in Sudan, uh, in Myanmar, and many other places. And we pray that you yourself will work mightily and bring peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we said earlier, as we're going to be uh, reflecting on the global nature of the body of Christ this week in chapel. So we'll be hearing our scripture read to us in different languages, languages that represent different members of our community. So you will, they'll come up and they'll read a portion of their passage. And the portion that they're reading will be on the screen behind me in English for you to follow along. So let me first invite up a brother Roly to read, beginning from Jonah 4, 1. Let's read God's word in French. Jonas le prit très mal et se mit en colère. Il adressa cette prière à l'Éternel. Ah, Éternel, je le savais bien. Je l'avais bien dit quand j'étais encore dans mon pays. Et c'est pour prévenir cela que j'ai fui à Tarsis. Car je savais que tu es un Dieu plein de grâce et de compassion long à la colère et riche en amour, et que tu renonces volontiers à faire venir le malheur que tu as annoncé. And I'll read verse 3 to 5 in Korean. 여호와여, 원하건대 이제 내 생명을 거두어 가소서. 사는 것보다 죽는 것이 내게 나음이니다 하니. 여호와께서 이르시되 내가 성내는 것이 옳으냐 하시니라. 요나가 성읍에서 나가서 그 성읍 동쪽에 앉아 거기서 자기를 위하여 초막을 짓고 그 성읍에 무슨 일이 일어나는가를 보려고 그 그늘 아래에 앉았더라. I'm reading from Equapemchi from Ghana. Jonah chapter Four verses six and seven. Pachamoma in Tia Ena erade yankopong ma added in Kruma and a contour. Bififi, sir, and Catayona so. Na unya uwini a ebegeno effi, na huyemu. Na contour ye in tea, yona eniji, papa, papa. Nan so. Adeche a enim rebai by no. O yankupon ma osa. Yankupon ma osa. Be, be wea kuntuano ma ewuye. Yame asemni. I'll read the verse uh, eight to nine in Japanese. 太陽が昇った Verses 10 and 11 in Telugu. Anduk Yehova, Nibu Kastapakundanu, Penchakundanu, Okaratrilo, Neputi, Perigi, Okaratrilone, Vadipoina. Is Soracha to Visham Loni which are Parchunawe Aite Nuta Irova the Vela Kante Ekuai Kudi Adamalu Yerugani Janamo Bahu Pasula Nugala Neneve Maha Puramu Visham Lo Nen Vichara Pada Vada 
అని అని యోనాతో సెలవిచ్చాను We're going to be continuing this week in our series and hope in the midst of brokenness journeying with the minor prophets and we come this week to the prophet Jonah we're we'll hearing from our very own Dr. Eric Tully Dr. Tully if you come give us the word of the Lord today Well thank you for inviting me to participate in this series If you haven't already done so Uh, please turn in your Bibles to Jonah chapter 4 so you can follow along. We'll look through the text and then draw some conclusion and application at the end. A man named Christopher Watts was unfaithful to his wife and committing adultery. He had tried to cover it up, but early one morning in August of 2018, it was just almost exactly five years ago, his pregnant wife returned home from a business trip and they got into an argument and in the early hours of the morning the argument escalated and in the end Christopher ended up murdering his wife and after taking her body and his two living young girls to an oil field he killed his young girls and buried them all there and two year two days later he was arrested and sentenced to five life sentences without the possibility of parole. But that is not the end of the story because put in solitary confinement, Christopher Watts began to read the Bible. And a year later in 2019, a reporter interviewed him at the federal prison where he is living out the rest of his days. And Christopher says that he has found a relationship with God. He has experienced God's amazing grace. Now he re- reads the Bible frequently and sends passages of scripture to his parents. So he has a powerful testimony of God's grace. But later a woman named Stephanie, who is an elementary school teacher, called into a popular Christian podcast and said, quote, "After following the news closely, Back when Christopher Watts was originally suspected of this heinous crime, my reaction to his so-called finding God was anger. Is it wrong for me to not want this man who committed unspeakable acts to know my Jesus? Interesting, my Jesus. Do you believe someone like him can truly repent and enter the kingdom of God? And the pastor on the podcast responded, God is gracious to whom he will be gracious. This man may have sinned for an entire lifetime, stolen from others and worse, and yet he can be forgiven one hour before he dies. We live we we love God's grace. We sing about God's grace. We sing the song Amazing Grace and grace grace that is greater than all my sin. We we love it. We depend on it. It is the bedrock of our faith as Christians it is the essence of the gospel but sometimes when we really think about it god's grace presents us with a problem it isn't it just doesn't seem right does it it doesn't seem right that people who have done terrible things are forgiven and just let off the hook it doesn't seem right that God's anger toward truly awful sins just sort of evaporates when a person repents. But I would say that that actually it's only when we wrestle with the problem of grace, it's only when we're somewhat offended by it, when we struggle over its full implications that we have really come to understand what it is. and this problem of god's grace is the subject of jonah chapter 4 and because that's the conclusion it is the subject of the entire book it's one thing to know the di- the dictionary definition of grace it's it's another thing to see it in action in the bible or in our lives but the book of jonah forces us to stare it down to face it to confront the full implications of what it means so that we look at grace in a new light and we look at god in a new light and we begin to look at ourselves in a new light as well 
Okay, let's review what's happened in the, in the story so far. Back in chapter 1, God is well aware that a huge city called Nineveh is wicked. So he calls his prophet Jonah to go and preach against it. Nineveh had a reputation for brutality, what today we would call war crimes. Forced marches, enslavement, uh, cutting off uh, noses and heads and other kinds of dismemberment and impaling people on spikes and disfiguring and torturing people. And they bragged about it and the kings decorated their palace walls with reliefs of it, even reliefs of the torturing of the people of Judah. And God says to Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. We aren't told at that point why he ran, but it would make sense. Maybe he was afraid. If Jonah has this brutal reputation, and they're torturing and dismembering their enemies, I mean, what do they do to foreign prophets who come and tell them they're doing wrong? Can you imagine going to Nineveh and saying, thus saith the Lord, you're all uh, sinning? That doesn't sound like a very smart move. We aren't aren't told why he runs in chapter 1, but that would be a good reason. But God doesn't allow Jonah to run. He causes a storm and he threatens to sink the ship. And the only way to save the sailors on the ship is to throw Jonah overboard to certain death. In chapter 2, God saves Jonah from drowning by providing a fish as a lifeboat. There is no indication that Jonah is sorry for what he's done or that he repents, and yet God shows mercy and grace to him anyway. And Jonah loves that mercy. He prays a prayer in the fish, thanking God for his grace. In chapter 3, Jonah still doesn't want to go to Nineveh, but he realizes, I think at this point, that he really has no choice And so he goes and he mumbles something under his breath, five words in Hebrew, you know, 40 days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the Ninevites don't kill him. They're stricken with conviction. And they fast and they wear mourning clothes and they humble themselves before God and they repent immediately and comprehensively from the, from the smallest to the greatest. Even the king rips his clothes and puts on mourning clothes and And he says, who knows, maybe God will have mercy on us. And chapter 3, verse 10 says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So the book of Jonah is full of surprises. In chapter 1, it's a surprise when Jonah runs from God. In chapter 2, it's a surprise when the fish saves Jonah's life. It's a surprise when the Ninevites repent. And then in chapter 4, when God shows mercy to Nineveh, it's a surprise how Jonah reacts. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. This is a surprise. Jonah has just had incredible ministry success. He He has gone to probably the toughest audience on earth doing the most wicked things, and he has preached to them not a great sermon, and they have repented. It's great ministry success, and yet, he's angry. He's not angry that he failed in his mission, he's angry that he succeeded. He's not angry that the Ninevites persecuted and tortured him, he's angry that they took him seriously. He's not angry that God was harsh with his listeners, despite his intercessory prayer, but that God showed them mercy. In the original Hebrew, the word displeased in chapter 4, verse 1, is the word ra'ah. It was very evil to Jonah. That's a play on words. See, because back in chapter 1, verse 2, God says that the ra'ah of Nineveh, the evil of Nineveh has come up to him and he's become aware of it. And now God's mercy is extremely ra'ah to Jonah. It's offensive to him. It offends him. And he prays to the Lord in verse 2, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. 
For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. When Jonah says, O Lord, that is how people in the Old Testament cry out in grief or suffering for some relief. Jonah is in deep distress. And now finally at the end of the book, we learn why he had tried to run from God back in chapter 1. It wasn't because he was afraid to go to Nineveh. It wasn't because he was afraid of being persecuted, persecuted or tortured. It was because he was afraid that God would show mercy to the people of Nineveh. Jonah says, I knew it. I knew it. I knew that you are a gracious God. See, back in chapter 3, the king of Nineveh did not know what God was like. He says, who knows? We can repent, but I don't know if God will show us mercy. But Jonah knows. Jonah knows the great creed found in Exodus 34, 6. He knows that God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. And that is why Jonah tried to run away to Tarshish. That's why he was determined to get to Tarshish and away from Nineveh. Because even though God said that he knew about the evil of Nineveh, and even though God said he wanted Nineveh, uh, Jonah to preach against Nineveh, Jonah thinks to himself, no, no, no. I know what's going on here. God loves to show mercy. He loves to show every opportunity to show grace. He may say he wants me to preach against the people of Nineveh, but I wouldn't be surprised if in the end he finds a way to show them mercy after all. And of course, that's exactly what happened. God introduced himself to Israel as a gracious God. He's a God gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And Jonah truly believes that. It's not just something God says, it's something God does. He knows it's true. God has not acted out of character in chapter 3. He did just what Jonah expected him to do, and that's the problem. Here's what Jonah wants. He wants to see Nineveh burn. He wants to see the, Nineveh, the people of Nineveh die. He's been hoping for judgment. He's been dreaming of judgment. He has been looking forward to fire raining down on them from heaven or some enemy army giving them a taste of their own medicine. Look what they have done. Look at the atrocities that they have committed. Look at the feet and the hands and the noses and the faces that they have cut off. Are they going to pay for that? Is God going to judge them for that evil, for the countless people that they have inflicted misery upon? So when God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh, Jonah thinks to himself, you know, there is a very good chance that God is going to try and find a way to show mercy to these people, and I don't want any part of that. These people deserve to burn for what they've done. And he says in verse 3, Oh, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. He says, just kill me. I don't even want to live in a world where you show mercy to people like this and disregard justice. And the Lord says in verse 4, Do you do well to do angry, to be angry? That's the way, the, the way that the ESV and the NIV translate this. It, it sounds like God is asking if it's right for Jonah to be angry, if it's legitimate for him to be angry. But that, that is not what the Hebrew says. A better translation that we find in the Net Bible is, why are you so angry? It's about the intensity of his anger. It's one thing for Jonah to struggle over God's mercy. But where is this intense anger coming from? What is driving this? What is, why is he so angry that he's willing to die? Without answering, 
Jonah goes outside the city of Nineveh and he sits down. Until he should see what would become of the city. Now, this, this verse is a little bit difficult to understand. He's, he's already seen the Ninevites repent. He's already seen God show mercy, so I'm not sure what he's waiting for. It's possible that he's going to sit there stubbornly until God comes through. It's possible he says, I'm going to sit here until I see, until I see justice. It's hot. The sun is high in the sky. Jonah's outside. And so God shows Jonah mercy. He appoints a plant, just like he appointed the fish in chapter 2, to grow up quickly and to provide Jonah with some shade. It says in verse 6, to save him from his discomfort. Now, the wording here is important. The word discomfort is also ra'ah. In 3.10, God had determined not to bring ra'ah on Nineveh. And he did not do it. But now, God appoints a plant to save or deliver Jonah from ra'ah, from his discomfort. See, in chapter 3, God had saved Nineveh from a big ra'ah. And now in chapter 4, he saves Jonah from a little ra'ah. Jonah is not experiencing great destruction, great personal injury here. The sun is a little bit hot on his head. It's discomfort. But God shows grace to him and mercy, and he shades him from the ra'ah with this plan. And, of course, Jonah loves it. He loves it. He, he was exceedingly glad, it said, because of the plant. And all that day in the hot afternoon, he's sitting under that plant in comfort as he maintains his vigil. But it says in verse 7, when the dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. We, we aren't told anything about this plant, just like we aren't told anything about the fish. The, the author is not interested in the details about how all this works what species it is or whatever. But, but the point is, God showed Jonah mercy by shading him from the sun and then he withdrew it so that Jonah once again experienced that little judgment. In verse 8, the day goes on and the sun rises up in the sky and it starts to get hot and the sun is beating down again on Jonah's head. God's mercy has been removed and the little judgment is back again and he's faint and he's miserable and he can't take it anymore. And he says in verse 8, let me die. It is better for me to die than to live. Oh God, kill me now. I can't take the discomfort any longer. And God says to him again, are you really that angry? Why are you so intensely angry about this? And Jonah says, yes, I am that angry. I'm angry enough to die. You may have noticed that the exact same wording occurs in verses 1 through 4 and in verses 6 through 9. In verses 1 through 4, Jonah was very angry that God showed mercy to Nineveh. And he says, it's better to die than to live. And God says, are you really that angry? And then in verses 6 to 9, Jonah is very happy about the plant. He's very happy that he's been shown this mercy. And, but when it's taken away, he says, it's better for me to die than to live. And God says again, are you really that angry? And Jonah says, yes. And that brings us to the conclusion of the book. In verses 10 and 11, the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. In other words, God says to him, Jonah, you, you have compassion on this plant. It's, it's basically a weed. It grew on its own. You didn't, have, you didn't invest anything in this plant. You aren't a farmer. You didn't plant it or tend to it or water it or make it work. And you've known this plant for exactly... One day, that's hardly enough time to develop a personal and intimate connection with it. Why do you love this plant so much? And then God says in verse 11, And should I not pity Nineveh, 
that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle, should I not pity Nineveh? The word pity is the same in verse 10 and 11. You pity a weed. I pity a great city. You didn't work for that plan. But I created the people of Nineveh. You knew that plant for one day. These are my people. The plant is just a weed. But the city is filled with 120,000 people and animals. It's valuable. It's precious to me. So why should I not be gracious? And beyond that, Nineveh is ignorant. The fact that they don't know their right hand from their left is a further reason for compassion. Israel had the law and the prophets and the covenants, but Nineveh is ignorant. And so God pities them. Jonah sees a city filled with evildoers who need to be taught a thing or two. God sees a city teeming with life, ignorant of the truth, precious people who are made in his image. And he has pity on them. His heart is inclined to grace. And that's the end of the book. How did Jonah respond? We don't know. We're left to ponder the nature of God and the nature of grace. Each of the chapters in the book of Jonah builds a theological foundation that leads to chapter 4. In chapter 1, we see God rescue pagan sailors on the boat, even though Jonah is a bad prophet and isn't helping. But it shows us that God cares about the lost. In chapter 2, we learn from Jonah's own mouth that salvation belongs to the Lord. It is God who saves, it is God who shows mercy, and there is no grace apart from him. In chapter 3, we see that God will save anyone, even the Ninevites, if they repent. Those first three chapters set up some crucial theology that leads to this in chapter 4. And and this is what I think is the main point of chapter 4. God's grace is for those who don't deserve it. That seems simple enough. Doesn't sound particularly profound. But that's the definition of grace, right? God's grace is for those who don't deserve it. If we earn it, it is in grace. If we deserve it, it is in grace. Everyone that God gives grace to is undeserving. That's pretty, that's pretty basic. It's pretty elementary. But it's only when we see the problem of grace that we really begin to understand it. Jonah has encountered God's grace in Nineveh. He's coming to understand it, but he has to face it down, and he gets angry. Angry enough to die, actually. And that leads us to ask, why is he so angry? Well, by way of application, let's quickly talk about two, three reasons, kind of two and a half. <laughs> three reasons why Jonah is angry at God's grace, and this is how we'll apply the passage to ourselves. First of all, Jonah underestimates his own sin, and that makes God's grace cheap. This point comes from the relationship between Jonah's attitude here in chapter 4 and his attitude in chapter 2 when he was inside the fish. The word pray occurs exactly two times in the book, only twice, In chapter 2, when he's inside the fish, he reflects on the events of chapter 1, and he's so happy that God saved him from drowning, but he's completely tone deaf. He makes God's grace cheap because he never comes around to admitting his own sin. He doesn't repent. He doesn't confess. He loves God's mercy, and he loves God's grace when it's for him. In chapter 4, he's outside Nineveh, and he reflects on the events of chapter 3, and he's so angry that God showed mercy to Nineveh. And as he pouts under that weed, he has evidently forgotten that God saved him from judgment, even though he deserved to die in chapter 1, and even would not repent. God's grace is for anyone who truly repents, but Jonah didn't. Therefore, you could argue that he was more undeserving of judgment than the people of Nineveh, but he doesn't see it that way. 
he's blissfully unaware of his own sin. He thinks God's grace is great. But it wasn't that big of a deal for God to show mercy to him because he isn't that bad. So we can see it so clearly in the way this book is structured. In chapter 2, he's so thankful that God let him live. But in chapter 4, he's so angry that he let the Ninevites live. It is so easy to see the sin of other people. We're annoyed by their sin. We're offended by it. We're disgusted by it. If we had to characterize their sin as a disease, it would be cancer. But it's hard to see our own sin. We excuse it. We justify it. We explain it away. And if I had to characterize my own sin as a disease, it would be a paper cut. And that affects the way we think about grace. When God shows grace to me, it isn't that big of a deal. I like it. But God has not forgiven me that much. My sin is small and unimportant. And the longer we think that way, in our mind, grace begins to shrink in value. And our view of grace gets smaller and smaller and wimpier and wimpier. And pretty soon, just like my own sin isn't that big of a deal, God's grace isn't that big of a deal. If the disease is unserious, the cure must be unserious too. And then, when we find, when we hear that God has shown grace to a really bad sinner, we're shocked. How can that bad person expect to receive mercy from God? What injustice. Because my sin feels like a tiny paper cut and grace feels like a little band-aid, we're offended when God uses it to cure cancer. The book of Jonah allows us to see ourselves in the prophet Jonah and to face our pride. God's grace is for those who don't deserve it. It's for the pagan sailors in chapter 1. It's for the disobedient prophet in chapter 2. It's for Christopher Watts who committed adultery and heinous murder. And it's for all of us, all of us who are undeserving. My sin is worse than I think. But God's grace is also stronger than I think. It's deep and it's wide. It's not amazing that God shows grace to other people. It's amazing that he shows compassion to me. The second reason for Jonah's anger is that he minimized the worth of the Ninevites. He was looking forward to judgment on Nineveh. He wanted to see the city conquered and the people suffer not just so that justice would be done, but so that he would feel better. One thing that you may have wondered as we went through chapter 4 is, is what is the meaning of this plant? It's, it's an odd thing that the, verses, the chapter is 11 verses long, and six of those verses, more than half of them, are dedicated to this weed. I think the plant has two functions in this story. First... It shows Jonah what it feels like for God to withhold grace. When God takes the plant away and the sun beats down, in a little judgment, Jonah hates that. He says, hey, I like that mercy. Bring it back. But of course, this is tone deaf because he wants God to take away mercy from Nineveh. But I think the plant also has a second function. Do you remember at the end of the chapter... God says to Jonah, you have compassion on a plant, but I have compassion on the city. And that raises the question, why does, God lo- why does Jonah love that plant so much? And the answer is, because it gave him comfort. He loved that plant because it gave him comfort from the sun. It shaded his head, and he put a huge value on that weed because of the way that it benefited him and a tiny value on Nineveh because it offended him. He got confused about value. He valued his own comfort more than a whole city full of people. 
Sometimes we want to see other people face judgment. Sometimes we want to see them suffer because of what they've done. Because let's face it, some people have hurt us badly. They've lied about us. They've mistreated us. They've abused us. They have made us feel insecure. They've taken away our happiness. They've made it hard and difficult to trust other people. And if we're honest, we're afraid that if God shows them mercy, if he forgives them, then they're just going to get away with it. When I was in middle school and high school, it was a very difficult time of my life. I had just come back to the States uh, permanently from being a missionary kid in Central Africa. I was vulnerable. I was living in a new culture that I didn't understand. I did not have any friends. And the other kids in seventh and eighth and ninth grade bullied and mistreated me relentlessly. They took their pens and wrote on my shirt. They spit on my head. They made fun of the way that I looked. They teased me in gym class. They ignored me. They shoved me into lockers and tried to fight with me after school. And that happened in seventh grade and in eighth grade and in ninth grade. And it just seemed like it went on and on. I didn't have anyone sticking up for me. I was, I was trying to be a good Christian kid. I was a good kid. I was, I was really trying to live for the Lord in that, in that difficult circumstance. But I remember one day in ninth grade in Mr. Skidmore's algebra class, I was sitting there trying to mind my own business where all the kids around me were talking about all of the sexually deviant things they'd done at the party that weekend, all the sin that they had committed, all the drinking and debauchery, and they were laughing and having a great time, and I was sitting there alone. And I remember very clearly thinking to myself, you know what, it's okay. It's okay because I'm a Christian and someday I'm going to be living in heaven with Jesus and all of these kids are going to be burning in hell. It, I'm not, I don't think it's funny. I'm not proud of that. I was 15 years old. I was hurting. Think about that for a moment. I wanted relief from their abuse. And so I comforted myself with their eternal damnation. Like Jonah, I was not weighing things properly. The Bible tells us that we should long for justice. We should pray for it. The psalmist pray for God to avenge them and to punish the wicked. And the prophets look forward to the day when God will set everything right. And put down evil once and for all when his people will finally live at peace with him. So we should be encouraged that God's justice will happen and that someday we will live with him. But we don't comfort ourselves with their damnation. And we don't hope that they won't repent so that they can receive mercy. We need to remember that the most wicked person, the worst person, the person who has hurt us is made in God's image. He created that person. He loves that person. And God would always prefer to show mercy. After all, God's grace is for those who do not deserve it. I think God is actually very patient with Jonah in this chapter. He, Jonah feels so strongly about this. He's so offended that God would not, that God would not make Jonah and Nineveh pay for what they've done. And I, I think God understands his concerns. Look at how patient God is here. He, he doesn't yell at Jonah. He isn't harsh with him. He doesn't say, Jonah, you fool, you hypocrite. He lets Jonah vent. He lets Jonah rage. He, ha he has his little pity party. And then he simply says, I have compassion on Nineveh. Verse 
They're wicked. They've hurt a lot of people. But they're valuable to me. And grace is for those who don't deserve it. Even you, Jonah. Even them. Very quickly, third, Jonah is angry because God is being fundamentally unjust. We know the definition of grace, that it is God's unmerited favor. That it is mercy that we don't deserve. But knowing that definition is not enough. We need to struggle over grace until we see all of its hard edges. Until we're forced to accept that it's for bad people. That's when we understand it. I have a friend named Steve who, whose dad is not a believer. Steve talked to his dad about Jesus Christ. About how Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead in order to offer God's grace and mercy to everyone. And he told his dad that through Jesus, anyone can be saved from their sin. And Steve's dad said to him, I know, that's the problem. It means that people can be really wicked their entire lives, and then Jesus can forgive them before they die at the last minute. That does not seem right to me. I can't accept that. And so he refused to become a Christian because of the problem of grace. And I said to Steve, I know your dad isn't a Christian, but he's right. He understands grace. So let's pray for him and for his future hope for him. When God really saves bad people, that isn't a perversion of grace. It is the definition of grace. God is a God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. He has compassion on us because we are weak and ignorant and sinful, and he offers grace to us even though we don't deserve it. Let's pray. Father, we love to say that over and over. You are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting over disaster. When we were dead, dead in our trespasses and sins, you quickened us. You gave us life in Christ Jesus. And it is by grace that we have been saved. We pray that through this book and through the rest of scripture, that we would understand what you have done for us and that we would think about these things the way that you do. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's rise together and respond and reflect on the grace-giving love of our God and who he is.
keeper, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working, even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. Even when I don't see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. darkness my god that is who you are we make a miracle work promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you And now receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of the Father, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. There's refreshments for you in the back. Thank you and have a wonderful week.